Has the clock started? I'm getting an extra minute. So I want to I want to just briefly show some of the key findings that we uh, had from this study of uh, vaccination and specifically adult vaccination influenza vaccination behaviours in uh, adult populations across five countries. And I want to make a single comparison with another series of studies that we've been doing with Gail that she'll go into far more depth uh, in her presentation. But my aim is to just make a, a connection between the results that we find in the general public and in healthcare workers. And so this work, um, <coughs> This work was done with Nick, who's just arrived. G'day, Nick. Glad you could make it. With Nick Sevdalis, who's now at King's, um, our objective was to uh, develop a validated tool that could measure um, correlates of uh, social psychological correlates of uh, vaccination behaviour in adults. Uh, we looked at flu and at tetanus containing boosters and at vaccination in general. The data that I'll show you is primarily the data on the top. Um, this was based, the quantitative studies done in uh, five countries, US, UK, France, China, Mexico, and we're about to have data in Poland, uh, was based on uh, a large systematic literature review and qualitative studies in six different countries. And our aim was really to come up with a tool or tools that would allow us to measure across different contexts, which is why we included countries like Brazil, um, India, in addition to those other countries. Um, with Gail, I won't go into this detail in detail because she'll talk about this, but with Gail, uh, we started, uh, we, we established, we've developed a, a tool that measures both um, in healthcare workers' attitudes to vaccinate, um, attitudes towards vaccination, but also attitudes to advocate for vaccination. Um, we have data from those five countries, but we've now taken a, a trimmed down version of this and my colleagues um, across almost 20 other countries are employing this tool as well. So we're starting to use these tools to generate a large body of comparative data that um, hopefully will be quite interesting. Uh, you see there, in many countries, we're, we're gathering data on both adults and healthcare workers at the same time. The first thing that we aimed to do was to come up with a, an acceptance index. Uh, we're going to have to change the name of this because there are a number of acceptance indexes coming out now. And actually, I think that there's a job for us to do now for us to get together and decide what is the tool that we're going to use to track acceptance with. It certainly shouldn't be a single question around safety. Um, what we developed here uh, was uh, six questions that were the most strongly correlated with the statement, I generally trust vaccination. So in fact, what we developed, I guess, is a, is a trust index. Uh, those questions, importantly, were trust-related questions. Um, in addition to I'm personally in favour of vaccination, uh, it forms part of a healthy lifestyle. We see that trust of uh, manufacturers or pharmaceutical companies and of the authorities was there. What's interesting about indexes, indices like this is that they give us comparative data. They allow us to compare across contexts and um, consistent with uh, what we saw in a 64 country study that's just been published, uh, the level of confidence or trust in vaccination in France is significantly lower than anywhere else. Also in China, and remember here where we're, we're surveying adults about vaccination in general, it was significantly lower as well. Um, Trust underpins acceptance, and I think this is coming through more and more in, in studies that are, that are being published, and um, we need to bear this in mind. This is an interesting way of comparing data across those uh, five countries, uh, looking at trust in vaccines, moving from left to right, medications, authorities, manufacturers, alternative medicine. Um, if you just concentrate on the left-hand panel, please, uh, you see, for example, that in France, trust is consistently lower on every measure. Um, which kind of uh, echoes what we've been uh, hearing here in France. In Mexico, trust was consistently higher. And um, again, this is just a way of looking comparatively at levels of trust in these different um, things. Uh, interestingly, we see in, uh, in France, trust in alternative medication is equivalent to trust in medication. I'm not sure, I'm not gonna make a comment on that. Um, Sources, I'm staying with trust, sources of information, um, consistent with lots and lots of data. Healthcare workers are the most trusted source of information for, an uh, for a flu vaccine. Um, we see, again, differences between the countries. What I want to point out is at the far right, that's trust in information on social media. The only country that really had high levels of trust in social media was Mexico, but the Mexicans trust everything just as the French trust nothing. Um, now, 
this is where I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes. Um, we teased out the um, correlates of flu vaccination behaviour. This was stated behaviour from the people um, in these samples. What I didn't mention was that these were nationally representative samples of 18 plus, the population 18 plus, large 850 odd samples. Um, and we looked at correlates of stated behaviour. And there are a few interesting things that come out. What I've put here is just the US, UK and France for, for, for us to, to, to get an idea of what's going on. We see that in all three countries, a recommendation from a healthcare worker is a strong um, correlate of, of uh, vaccination behavior, extra, very, very high in France. The odds ratio there is five, which is interesting. What we see also next down is that severity of disease is not a predictor of behavior. We also see um, that domains like vulnerability to flu and likelihood of catching the flu are strong predictors, strong and consistent predictors across these countries. In fact, likelihood of, predicting, of catching the flu predicted behaviour in all of those, all five countries. And it was the only uh, factor that predicted in all five countries. Um, we see anticipated regret is important. <clears throat> and the other one that's, that came through is coping. So I am taking action to protect myself against the flu. Um, this, these studies used, uh, we had about 120 items that include items that had bubbled to the surface in the literature review in the qualitative studies, but also we included some um, other constructs such as, such as coping behavior, et cetera, to, to see what would come to the surface. And what we found was that coping came to the surface. Um, in contrast, adverse events uh, did not strongly predict and not consistently predict behavior and pain did not predict at all. Something that we did identify that's new is a, a, a scary health experience as a child was a predictor. So what does this mean? And, and I'm not going to go into the... I, I just want to look at what, what can we start to take from this very quickly. Well, the first thing is likelihood predicts across all of these countries. And likelihood is not a very hard thing to communicate. What we also found was that severity doesn't predict, and yet we rattle on about the number of people who die because of the flu every year. So we have here a number of more subtle dimensions upon which we can imagine um, communications and other interventions could push. My, my last point um, is that I, I want to just make a quick comparison between this data and the data that we generated with, with the instruments that Gail developed. So on the, on the right there you have people and on the left you have healthcare workers. Now, is that the same thing or not? Well, we find in both of these samples, so this is data from the UK, the data on the right is data from, um, from the nationally representative study, the data on the left is um, from a study in, in uh, four or five imperial, hospital, uh, imperial college hospitals, all frontline healthcare workers. So we find in both of these populations that a recommendation, a recommendation from my healthcare, work, from my healthcare worker or a recommendation from my line manager predict vaccination. We also find that likelihood predicts in these two populations. Remember the sneeze. But what we find is that disease severity predicts healthcare workers getting vaccinated, whether they will get vaccinated, but it is not a predictor in the general public nor really are concerns about vaccination when you, when you look at how these are weighted. Anticipated regret and coping behaviour is far more strongly predictive of this, of, immunize, of influenza immunisation behaviour in the general public. What this means is that if we're going to do this right, we must talk to people about what matters to them, not what matters to us. Um, very briefly, where we're going next is um, we have segmented the adult, these populations of adults, by behaviour, and we're working right now to break down these segments and create what we, what we, an expression we use in marketing, customer portraits. We want to understand who are the trustful vaccinees, who are the selective, who are the unconcerned, uh, what were their intentions to get vaccinated, what were their actual behaviours, what were the predictors in each of these populations. These, uh, when you do this kind of, um, when you do this, obviously there's a level of, um, there's a level of uh, arbitrariness in the way that you select these, and so you need to validate them. We haven't validated them on the right, but we did validate them on the left, 
And I haven't confirmed with Gail, but can I quickly show people the validation, Gail? <laughs> I meant to show this to you yesterday. Great. The trustful uh, vaccinators were also significantly more likely to get vaccinated. They were also significantly more likely to be confident advocates. The confident advocates were significantly more likely to give a recommendation. So in the healthcare workers, we validated these segments. <clears throat> so my conclusions, um, the top three things we can take away from this data, trust is the bedrock of vaccine acceptance. People don't see flu as a threat. They don't think it was something that's going to kill them. They cope with it like they cope with bad weather, perhaps. And finally, this kind of data, we need to take this kind of data and use it to understand what matters to people, not what matters to us. Thank you.